And we know that anxiety and depression are not light feelings. Once I help people find their sense of control again, then they naturally feel lighter and brighter with all the steps that we follow in that process. Decision fatigue is related to having a finite amount of choices. Mm. You've got between 10 or 20 choices you can choose, okay? Choice fatigue is completely different. Welcome, Delia. Welcome to Akira Seles Chronicles podcast. Thank you for the invitation, Rohit. Very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. So it's a very interesting episode today, uh, Dr. Delia McCabe, and it's all about neuroscience of decision making. But before we jump into that uh, topic, I would like you to please share something about yourself, where you come from, you know, your, your history, your, you know, your career to our audience, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, I was born in South Africa and uh, we left South Africa to move to Australia 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So I'm officially now an Australian citizen um, and I'm at the moment I'm actually in America. Uh, and as I said to you earlier, uh, we seem to choose places that start with an A. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but all the moving does make one, you know, you have to become pretty agile when you mm. move. You've got to be pretty agile and flexible. To, you find new places, you find new people, you find new, new networks. And so it's a really good workout for the brain. Um, just to get back onto, you know, career topic, I started out as a clinical psychologist and I mm -hmm. was really very interested in trying to help people talk themselves better. But along the way, while I was completing my master's, um, I discovered that nutrition is really critical to brain health, brain development and brain function and how we age, how our brain ages. And I had come basically to a fork in the road. I couldn't continue being a talking therapist knowing that a malnourished brain is harder mm. to optimize. Mm. And so it changed my career trajectory completely. And I then went down the path of lifestyle um, factors related to brain development and brain function. And so that's basically what I speak to today. And that's what my career is involved in. Um, and, you know, when I help organizations and I help individuals and I help groups, I help them understand how their brain functions, because once they understand how the brain functions, they know how to optimize it. Uh, and it's an amazingly interesting area to be involved in because we're learning so much about the brain all the time. And it gives me a lot of pleasure to be able to share this information with people because once people understand, you know, the, the power, the sophistication and the sensitivity of mm. the brain, they start shifting the way they, they look at their brain and how they use their brain. And that's ultimately what my goal is. To, to, you know, create that bridge for people so that they gain this understanding so that they respect their brain a lot more. Indeed, indeed. You know, when, when I was um, I was connecting with you, and thanks for sharing that, the white paper where our topic is based, uh, to the discussion is based on, you mentioned you teach people how they can be their lightest and brightest best self. So I want you to, um, I'm curious uh, your meaning of lightest and brightest best self. Uh, I love this question and thank you for asking this, Rohit. You know, light means that you don't feel heavy, you don't feel weighed down, mm. you don't feel overwhelmed. Um, living in the world today, a lot of people feel that way. You know, a lot of things feel as if they're out of our control. There's a lot of uncertainty um, and people feel that they don't have control over their lives and that leads to them feeling heavy, you know, and, and we know that anxiety and depression are not light feelings. So that's where the, the lightness comes in. The brightness comes in in relation to mood as well. You know, when mm. you are in a good mood and you feel happy and in control, you, you feel bright, you, you radiate that to other people and you also feel bright cognitively because we know that mood impacts cognition and we know that when people feel overwhelmed and uncertain and stressed they don't feel bright and you actually cannot access your full cognitive repertoire when you are feeling um, distressed about the world and about things that you can't control so the light and the bright refers to people feeling 
positive about life, feeling that they do have control, feeling that they can make a difference and therefore using their brains optimally. So it's a bit of a play on words, but it does allow people to, I think, feel hopeful mm. because we have more control than we realize, even though the world is a very complex and challenging place now. And one of the things that the brain hates, the worst kind of stress for the brain is to feel a lack of control. And once I help people find their sense of control again, then they naturally feel lighter and brighter with all the steps that we follow in that process. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. And, and you mentioned regarding um, this word is very complex. This word is like VUCA. We talk about it. And, uh, and, uh, Obviously, on that term, that's why decision making, for, especially for leaders, is really, really tough these days with all the, you mentioned, stress and everything. So what actually inspired you to focus on this area with the prefrontal cortex in relation to decision making? The reason I looked at this area was because the prefrontal cortex is like the conductor of an orchestra, if we mm. can think about it that way. Mm. So we... People think of the prefrontal cortex as the executive control center of the brain. So it's like the part of the brain that coordinates everything else. And it coordinates emotion and it coordinates behavior and it coordinates thinking. So it's, it's really the master conductor of all the things that happen in the brain. It's not the only important part of the brain, of course, but it is the most sophisticated part of the brain mm. because it's coordinating so many other activities and the other networks like the default mode network and so on. And the reason the prefrontal, prefrontal cortex caught my attention was because it's more energy demanding than the rest of the brain. So if we think about our body and we think about our brain in relation to the body, the brain is about 2% of body weight. Mm. Um, but it uses upwards of 20% of the energy that we consume to run it. And that's a huge amount considering its size relative to the body. The prefrontal cortex is only 10% of the brain volume, but it uses 20% of that other 20% plus. Mm. So it's smaller, but it's the most greedy part of the brain. And that's what really caught my attention because if that is the case, that means that when it runs out of energy, it's going to affect the whole brain and the, its capacity to pull together everything. It, it's going to be compromised in terms of it being the conductor. So that means it's going to impact emotion and emotion regulation. It's going to impact behavior and behavior regulation and inhibition. And it's going to impact thought, cognition, mm -hmm. and the capacity to think deeply and carefully and clearly. So for me, the prefrontal cortex, although it's not, you know, people say, well, it's not the most important part of the brain because the prefrontal cortex wouldn't exist if the rest yeah. of the brain didn't exist. And I understand all of that. But, but from the perspective of, of it being a conductor, I think it's really important that people pay attention to it because it is... The, the part of the brain that pulls together everything else, and this is important for decision making, this is important for leaders, um, it's important for all of us, of course, and I'll speak to this a little bit later, but especially for leaders who are pulling together a whole lot of information and have to take that information and analyze it, assess it, then look at what the repercussions of making decisions are going to be in the world that we in that we live in today there is an enormous amount of information that people have to take into account when they make decisions and that enormous amount of information needs to be channeled through the prefrontal cortex now we know that the prefrontal cortex works with our working memory that's our short-term memory and we know that the short-term memory, working memory, can all, only hold on to between seven to nine pieces of information at a time. Now, this is interesting because my husband um, can fly helicopters and mm. they even teach them that when they learn how to fly helicopters. You know, you can only keep that amount of information in your working memory at one point in time. 
So what does this mean for leaders? This is really critically important because if you are constantly gathering more and more and more information and more and more data, and now you trying to get your prefrontal cortex to filter that information, to analyze that information, to assess that information, to look at the consequences of enacting whatever you decide to, to enact, and you're just gathering more and more, your working memory actually cannot cope. And this is one of the challenges that are happening with people today because they have got all this information, not all of it is knowledge and very little of it is actually wise. Mm, <laughs> so true. they're still trying to siphon through all that information. Now, just to get back to the neuroanatomy or the neurophysiology for a moment, the prefrontal cortex doesn't have what we call automaticity. And that simply means it doesn't have an automatic um, repertoire to run through because mm. what it's exposed to is new information. And just to give a comparison, um, we have the hypothalamus, we have the pituitary gland and we have the adrenal glands and they have an automatic loop that the stress response puts into action. So you're walking along a path, you see a yeah. tiger, yeah. Um, the hypothalamus, the HPA immediately steps up and you start running before you think. So emotion travels faster in the brain than thought. Okay, that is an automatic response. You don't have to think about it. The prefrontal cortex doesn't have that, Rohit. So mm -hmm. it has to continuously make new connections because everything that you're taking in is new. And those novel concepts, those novel ideas, that new data, that new information now has to be thought of and analyzed in a new way. So when we think about prefrontal cortex functioning and we're thinking about decision making and we think about deep thought, deep work, deep cognitive work, we can only do that for between three to four hours per day because the prefrontal cortex runs out of energy. It cannot sustain this constant new connections, um, this, this ongoing analysis because it doesn't have the capacity to do that because there are no automatic workarounds. Mm. Now, this is what leaders need to take this into account because if they're constantly bombarding their brains with information and data and they're not allowing their brain any downtime, then it will be harder to make decisions because this prefrontal cortex, the greedy part of a really greedy organ, will run out of energy and most people know about this in the form of decision fatigue and the research around decision fatigue has got a lot of um, detractors because a lot of or how the research was conducted did have some limitations but anybody that has ever moved home which is the perfect example when you're moving home you get to the end of the day in that period of time where you're moving and you just I can't think anymore. You say it yourself. I can't decide where that needs to go. Just leave it until tomorrow. Mm. And the reason that happens is because the prefrontal cortex is actually no longer capable of making new connections. It's run out of energy. It doesn't have it anymore. Now, that is something that most people understand and they've experienced. A lot of people don't think about something called choice fatigue, which is different to decision fatigue. Decision fatigue is related to having a finite amount of choices. Mm. You've got between 10 or 20 choices you can choose. Okay. Choice fatigue is completely different. For example, you go onto the internet and you say, I want to find the best supplement for sleep. Now that's a whole new discussion, but the example will bring up millions of responses. Now that is, is what happens to a lot of people on an ongoing basis today. They have got too many choices. And once you go down the rabbit hole of those choices, your prefrontal cortex is involved in every single one of those options that comes up. You've got to assess it. You've got to decide, I like this and I'm going to investigate it or otherwise I don't want that. It's all prefrontal cortex activity. You move to the next one. So you end up with choice fatigue. And choice fatigue is, of course, related to information fatigue, which is just too much information. Where does that information stop? Where do you draw a line in the sand? And ultimately, what happens is the prefrontal cortex is taking the brunt of this. Mm. And this is why people are battling. Mm. So 
that's a long answer to your question about why I really am very interested in the prefrontal cortex and decision making because it is really the master of this beautiful orchestra. Now, just to throw something else into the mix, <laughs> um, <laughs> adding insult to injury, we must keep in mind that we are only aware of 5% of what goes on in our brain. That is 5% of our thinking we consciously aware of. Mm. There's 95% of what goes on is under the covers. We're not, we're not aware of it, um, consciously that is. But we do get feelings and, we, you know, our emotions tell us a lot about what else is going on in our subconscious. And as we know, feelings are fleeting and feelings are not always correct. Um, and we know from research that, that you know, where people speak about, oh, follow your gut, follow your mm. gut feeling. Our gut feeling isn't always right. Yes. So that's something else to keep in mind. Um, but then that's happening below the surface. When we bring it up, you know, above and we become conscious of it, then the prefrontal cortex once again get, gets involved in that. But if you think about what's happening today, there is so much information hitting us and so much of that information we can't control um, or, or what, what we're becoming aware of, we can't control. And then that is leaving us physically feeling a sense of overwhelm, which may not always even be reaching our consciousness. But ultimately, the prefrontal cortex is the, the, the final frontier in relation to what we do and what we think about consciously and what our emotions are and how well we regulate them and how we inhibit our behavior and our thinking process. So a lot of the people and teams that I'm working with now are complaining of a lack of energy. Mm. They feel a lack of physical energy energy, a lack of mental energy, and these things are intimately connected. You know, it's not as if we've just got a separate energy supply and a separate a physical supply. They, they, they connected. And so one of the reasons this is happening is because the prefrontal cortex is continuously being bombarded with information. There is no downtime anymore. Yeah. And leaders who don't give themselves a downtime are not allowing their brain to be creative, which is what the prefrontal cortex excels at. But it doesn't have any time to be creative now because there's too much information in its working memory. So just to, to add a little bit to the complexity here, when you're consciously thinking and you've got those seven to nine things in your working memory and you focusing on the task at hand and making a decision about what Whatever it is that you're needing to make a decision about, there is a whole lot of information sitting in your subconscious that now you can't access. However, you step away and you go for a walk. And if you look at some of the smartest people in the world, one of them being Einstein, he used to regularly go for walks. Mm. And he understood something intuitively that we neuroscience now understands the mechanism behind. When you go for a walk and you engage in a pursuit that is using your body and your brain isn't cognitively attending to a task, a beautiful thing happens. You now allow all that knowledge that's sitting in your subconscious to rise up, if I can put it that way. And so now your brain has access to that without you consciously focusing on it. And now your prefrontal cortex is allowed to, without any instruction from you, to just put together things in a new way, to form connections between thoughts that you hadn't had before. You're not thinking about them. You're not using these thoughts from your working memory, your short-term memory. They are now coming out from areas that you didn't, weren't focusing on, your long-term mm -hmm. memory, things that you think you've forgotten, a, a thought or a line you read in a book or something that someone said on a podcast, suddenly now you can connect these things. And this is what I really want leaders to take to heart. We become very, very creative when we go outside and we embody our cognition. We get our body involved in what's going on in our brain. And then we end up becoming much more creative and we make better decisions because now we've got access to a whole lot of information that, we didn't know was sitting there and just waiting to be used. Mm. 
you know, I was I was smiling because I do 10,000 steps a day. And uh, you won't believe what you, what you just said. Actually, I felt it, you know, that every time I go for a walk, a lot of thoughts, a lot of thoughts, which we, I haven't thought about it for like when I'm working in front of a computer. And then it comes out. Uh, every day, you know, I would, that's why I was smiling at the, yeah, that happens to me. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, yeah. now you know why that yeah, happens. Yeah, why that happens, yeah. Yeah. Another way to access that, that cognition is to do high intensity exercise. Mm. Um, so it's about 80% um, heart capacity, uh, heart and lung capacity, and you then go past that point of thinking. You go to the point of exhaustion really and you you're pushing your body so now you you don't have your short-term memory your working memory involved you now have access again to all that other information so there are different ways that we can use our body but i think the important lesson here is as 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 crazy as i am about the prefrontal cortex and has as amazed as i am about its sophistication um it can never be optimized unless we also use our body and I think, you know, our embodied cognition is something that a lot of people are now becoming aware of. And once you become aware of that as a leader, you can ensure that you use that to the best of your capacity. Um, and one of the ways to do that, and I know we're going to speak about this um, in a moment, is about how stress impacts the prefrontal cortex. Yeah. Yeah. That was, I was thinking that, uh, that how actually it's actually stress that impact uh, prefrontal cortex and actually impacts the decision making ability for the leaders this is a very important subject for me as well because as a leader you see you know we're doing so much stuff i think like you mentioned that so many options so many discussions and you actually not fully focused on it and then you get really stressed so i wanted to understand how actually this impacts you know so it is excellent excellent that we're discussing this because this is one of the problems you know there's too much information and all that information is creating more stress mm -hmm. now just to to clarify humans want to gather information mm -hmm. because gathering information is part of the reason that we became survivors it's part of the reason that we became so prolific we gathered information about the weather about the soil about the tribe <laughs> next door you know, mm -hmm. about all the things that were going on mm -hmm. around us. So gathering information is very natural and that's a huge challenge for us. I think there, there are so, there's so much information available today. I did a post on LinkedIn a while ago about how much information is generated every day and it boggles the brain because there is no way that one brain can keep up with all this information, really. Even in a field that is a very niche field like my field, you know, brain function. It's impossible to keep up with all the information. Yeah. If I tried to, I would drive myself insane. Mm. One of the things that happens, which I really would like people who are watching this to, to really take, take to heart, take to mind, take to brain, is the fact that when we experience chronic stress, what happens is that we have a lot of circulating cortisol. And cortisol actually impacts the brain directly and the prefrontal cortex in a very negative way because it stops neurons from being able to form connections with other neurons optimally. That, that, that chemical compound actually stops that, the ease of connection. And the ease of connection is the only way that we get new ideas and we are creative. It's because of new connections forming between neurons that hadn't formed before. So this is a very serious issue. And we, we know from research, we understand that mechanism, and we know from research what this looks like. And it looks like people will go for a response that they have already tried. Okay, so they will go for a habitual response when they're in a very... A, a chronically stressed situation where they've got too much information, they don't know what to do. And so what they do is do something that they've done before. So this is a situation where a leader will say, you know what, we did this. When that happened, we're going to do the same thing now. And the challenge with this is that it doesn't have any creativity attached to it. And the challenges we're dealing with today are novel challenges. <laughs> They are new challenges. They need new solutions. 
but when the brain is stressed it can't make those connections and so the researchers called this the exploit option of what the, the stressed brain does versus a calm and relaxed brain does the opposite it looks at exploring new options and this is something that one cannot talk away and you can't um, get somebody to say well i'm not going to let that happen to me when i am stressed this is something that is happening under the covers it's happening deep deep at the neuronal level and so leaders have to use different tactics to reduce the stress level because if they don't they will not be able to call on this creativity this explore mechanism that the brain has at its disposal and one of the ways to address this is to use distributed cognition so just to think about this for a moment think about the brain it is bound in it's in your head okay and just as an aside the brain never sees any light it never sees any sound you know it, it is in a dark place it requires our senses to stimulate it and its functioning now if you just spend all, all your time in your head thinking your own thoughts you end up just going around in circles and mm -hmm. i think this is what happens to a lot of leaders when they don't understand that distributed cognition gives everybody the opportunity to think about the problem from a different perspective because every brain is fingerprint and so your brain looks at something very differently to my brain and we put all these brains together and guess what we can come up with a better solution now this is something that i think a lot of leaders are embracing and they're working more closely with their teams if they don't have huge egos and they don't think they should have all the answers and they don't think that only they know the future no one can predict the future look where we are now yeah, yeah. <laughs> um so there are a few factors to take into account in this in this process but it is not possible for one brain to hold on to everything especially when that brain is battling with information overload and you know possibly high levels of stress at different points in time this is when you bring other brains in and say okay what do you think what is your perspective how can we look at it that way because only in that way can we actually see a a situation fully and leaders need to accept this this is nothing to do with your character it's nothing to do with your intellect it's to do with what happens deep within our neurons that we actually cannot control but we can control the stress response and one of the ways to do that is to check in with yourself and see if you are stressed and one of the ways that I teach people to do that is to check your heart rate mm. you know check where you're holding your stress in your body figure out what your particular stress trigger is and work with that to create new habits of mind around that. Because once you start doing that, you become stress resilient. You become more capable of dealing with stress. And that is reflected within your neurons because your neurons are no longer bathed in the cortisol. You've now reduced that cortisol release. And so you find that people then go, oh, I feel lighter, you know, I feel brighter. I feel like I can think more clearly now. And so they then approach their challenges differently and deep within their prefrontal cortex, they now have the capacity to form those connections. Um, you know, when people say to me, oh, I don't have time to go for a walk. I don't have time to go to the gym. I don't have time to meditate. I tell them that's when you should be doing it extra <laughs> because that's just showing you that you actually need those need ways of getting mm. out of your head um, and allowing your body to bring its wisdom and reduce your, your cortisol levels in the process. Mm. Amazing, amazing, uh, Dr. Delia, amazing. You know, I'm learning so much myself as well and um, I probably have to watch it and repeat, <laughs> you know, and to get more information, more understanding for this because it's such a small, like you said, it's such a small part of our being and then it does a lot of things for us, you know. And my, my next question was that, obviously, you discussed some some strategies, you know, walking, um, some exercise, high intensity uh, exercise. What are the strategies the leaders or anyone can actually employ to protect that uh, prefrontal cortex, especially from stress cortisol? Well, one of the things that, that people need to understand as well, and I know that there's a lot of information about sleep, 
So we mm. all know that sleep is really important, mm. but sleep is important because it cleans the brain. Mm. So the more thinking we do, the more we feel overwhelmed, the more we feel uncertain, um, the deeper our sleep needs to be because the cleaning of the brain, which, which actually gets rid of the metabolic waste that is caused during the day, um, when it hangs around, it impacts the, the health of those neurons. And we know clearly that um, the lack of sleep really is a major contributor to cognitive decline. Mm. So that's something that, that is critically important. The other thing to keep in mind is that look at the time that you make decisions. People should never, ever have decision-making time at the end of the day. That's just really not a smart thing to do because at the end of the day, what happens is that if there's a late meeting and you need to make a decision, what a lot of people do is they have a big cup of coffee. Now, I'm not against drinking coffee. I like it to be organic um, and it depends on the person about how much coffee they drink. But when people are using coffee to keep themselves alert, mm -hmm. they need to keep in mind that coffee is very, very good at increasing your focus and concentration because it works with adrenaline and dopamine, but it is very, very poor at increasing your creativity mm. because creativity isn't supported by adrenaline release. Adrenaline is just about quick, concise, immediate focus and decision. Just think about caffeine being related to running away from that tiger very, very quickly. The adrenaline mm -hmm. is fueling that behavior. So when people use coffee to make them alert and they have to go into a decision-making um, meeting or whatever it is, even if they're sitting by themselves and they've got some deep work to do, they just need to keep in mind they're fostering the focus and the concentration, but they're not focusing the, the creativity. So don't have meetings at a time where you need coffee. Have meetings earlier in the day when you can think clearly, when you can be creative, when you don't need that caffeine hit to give you energy. Um, the other thing to say, of course, and this is important, if you need coffee first thing in the morning to allow you to focus and concentrate, that is a sign that your mitochondria mm. are not generating energy efficiently. And we've got trillions of mitochondria within the brain hundreds of thousands within each neuron, and we've got 86 billion neurons. So you can imagine how many mitochondria we have. They're all generating energy. If you wake up in the morning and you need coffee to give you focus and concentration, then that's a sign that your mitochondria aren't firing on all cylinders, mm. and that needs to be fixed, okay? Of course, people get into the habit of drinking coffee, and that's fine. It's a ritual, mm. you know? And mm. if, if mm. you're doing it because it's a ritual and you enjoy it in the morning, that's fine. But if you can't function, without coffee. That is a different conversation because that means your brain is actually tired after sleep. And we know that caffeine impacts sleep. It impacts your, your, um, your brain's capacity to go into a deep sleep because it impacts the chemicals, a, a specific compound called adenosine, which influences how deeply your, you go to sleep at, at night. So, because it works with melatonin. So when people have coffee late in the day, it impacts their sleep. Even if they say, oh, I slept fantastically and I don't feel anything, what's happening once again deep at the neuronal level, which they can't see, mm. is not serving their brain. So those are some factors to keep in mind. And the other, of course, which is really simple to say, but difficult to put into action, is to keep blood glucose stable. And why? Because the brain has nowhere to store energy. You know, mm. it, it's a finite place. We store energy on our body in mm. the form of fat deposits, but mm. we can't store energy in the brain. And the brain is very, very careful about how it uses energy because it understands that it doesn't have anywhere to store it. So it's very fussy about that. Um, and keeping your blood glucose stable is fantastic because what it does then, it means that your brain never ever sends an adrenaline surge into your body to go and find food because a blood glucose dip in the brain is perceived as a very dangerous situation. And to counter that, the brain will send in a surge of adrenaline into your bloodstream. So then you end up with adrenaline 
increases of focus and concentration, a dip in creativity, mm -hmm. and also you have a greater chance of then storing any excess carbohydrates that you um, consume as fat when your blood glucose goes up and down and up and down. So maintaining a stable blood glucose is critically important for overall brain function, but specifically when you want to have your brain firing on all cylinders and you want to have clear, focused thinking, good decision making and creativity. So that's something that, that people really do need to understand. And that's related to nutrition and specific nutrients, which is you know a long conversation. Yeah. But that is something that, that is very important. And as I said, you know, it's only 2% body weight, but it uses more than 20% of the mm -hmm. energy that we consume. It's very, very greedy. And it's mm -hmm. very, very carefully calibrating that energy um, the stability of that energy of that blood glucose so when we mess with that we really mess with the brain and we know from research that when the brain runs out of energy neurons become damaged and if that continues for extended period of time you know consistently we mm. know that it causes neurons to die um, which is the same as what cortisol does when it bathes our neurons consistently so we need to make sure that you know we, we find a way to become more stress resilient because let's face it, stress isn't going anywhere. Yeah. We have to yeah. find out, we have to increase our tolerance for stress mm. and we have to ensure that our blood glucose stays stable. If we do those two things, we don't just make sure that we um, improve our capacity for decision making and creativity, we are also protecting our brain long term because not looking after the brain in those, you know, according to those factors impacts the brain directly. And the brain is so good at doing workarounds that we don't notice the symptoms of cognitive decline until 20 years after it started. So, you know, when I speak to leaders, I say, look, I know that you want to think more clearly. I know that you want to be more creative. I know that, that you want these things for the immediate gain for success and prosperity mm -hmm. and growth and productivity, all those great things. But what you need to understand is if you do these things now, what you're ensuring is a healthy brain in 20, 30, 40 years time. You know, your future self will really thank you for what you're doing today to make mm -hmm. sure that you're looking after the brain because it is very, very hard to reverse cognitive decline because the brain does not grow new neurons. There are only two places the brain grows new neurons. That's in your hippocampus, which is your memory center, memory CEO, mm -hmm. and in your amygdala, which is your fear lighthouse. Let's call it that. There are a few other places that researchers think the brain may grow neurons, new neurons, but we don't know this for sure. And me personally, with all the research that I've done, it's err on the side of caution. Let's look after this very sensitive and sophisticated piece of tissue that we cannot replace. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Interesting. You, you know, we, you mentioned regarding what leaders can do. And I'm now quite curious to understand in your experience and your understanding, your thoughts, how organizations can support their leaders in maintaining their brain health and decision-making capabilities and kind of less stress, basically. Great question. One of the problems we have is that often leaders think that they need their teams, mm. you know, the managers underneath them to be more productive and they need to be more engaged, which is a huge problem now um, in organizations. Engagement has never been as low as it is right now. And they think if that happens, then everything is going to be perfect and everything will work well. They don't understand that they have to start at the top. They've got to start with themselves. And that's something that, when I suggest that to them, they think that that maybe is a sign of weakness, you know, mm -hmm. to admit that they are in need of support. But it's not a sign of weakness because their brain is just like everyone else's brain. You know, <laughs> they may have, you, you, they've still got neurons there. You know, I always yeah. start from first principles. If you've got a neuron, hopefully 86 <laughs> billion of them, then yeah. you're going to need the same things as all the other people. Mm. brains who have neurons so mm. it is for me the best approach is when the leader says you know what this is something important i want my organization to be a brain thriving organization i want this organization to 
understand that the human brain is the driver of true creativity and we not, can't rely on AI to solve our problems for us <laughs> because AI is trying to solve the problems related to the challenges that we've had. It can't anticipate optimally, you know, what the future looks like. And when people invest in their own people and their own creativity, human creativity, they then have a much, much better chance of increasing engagement, increasing productivity. We know this is the case. We've seen it from research. Organizations that value their, the well-being of their staff um, improve productivity, improve engagement. The return on investment is great. So in answer to your question, the organization will end up supporting the leader if the leader understands that they need a similar type of support. And then it just becomes an environment where people think differently about the brain. They think about the brain as something that is not just something that needs to be managed. It's something that needs to be nurtured so that it can flourish and so that people can thrive. Because in an environment like that, people become proactive. Naturally, they become more productive. They've got higher levels of energy, physically and mentally. And what does that mean? More creativity for the organization. And if we've ever needed creativity more, I don't know of that time in history. I think we're living at the <laughs> point we where we need, yeah, we need it in, in, in spades. Yeah. And I think organizations are trying lots of other things, you know. They bring in different frameworks and different strategies. You know, I was hearing about a, a program the other day about where they bring Lego into an organization. And they teach people how to make ducks with Lego. Yeah, and they think yeah. that's going to make them more creative. And I'm like, hold on a second, guys. <laughs> the brain making the duck may be exhausted. Yeah. That brain yeah. may be burned out. Yeah. <laughs> you know, all of those things you need to yeah. get there first, yes. which is why I always yeah. start, you know, yeah. at, at first principles. Yeah. Um, so companies will try a lot of weird things because the mm. people that sell those things are really mm. good at selling them. Mm -hmm. but they don't actually understand what's going on at, at the neuronal level. So, yeah, yeah it's a bit of humor. Yeah, it, it's, it made, me, made me laugh out loud <laughs> because I've seen it myself, right, in the organization. So this is what happens. You know, we, we tend to do a lot of stuff to say, oh, we, we for his more mental well-being, but nobody actually thinks how loaded we are with our thoughts, how busy our brain is. You know, like you mentioned, like you f start there first, you know. Take out that thing, take out the stress. This is just one more thing I want to add in relation Please, yeah. to leaders and how mm. they can um, help help their organizations. Um, organizations also have this really, really bad habit of just adding technology mm. to, to the workflow. And I think the latest data now is that organizations are on average using 16 different apps and the data that's come out from that is that lots of the people that work with these apps say that they can't find the information that they need quickly. They're making wrong decisions because they can't find that information. They are overwhelmed with information that isn't relevant to them. And the more often they're working with these different apps, just bring our prefrontal cortex back into it again. Our prefrontal cortex has to decide, is this relevant? Isn't this relevant? Do I need to look at this? Don't I need to look at this? How am I going to use this? All of that depleting once again, this beautifully creative part of our beautiful brain. So when leaders look at what new technology they're bringing it in, you know, they can bring it in. And the person selling it may say, oh, it's going to increase productivity. But that person is only interested in selling that piece of software. Yeah. That person is, doesn't understand what another piece of technology is going to be doing to that workforce. Is it mm -hmm. actually going to improve productivity? So that's something else to think about. Be very circumspect about what you are using to keep tabs on or monitor work or whatever it is you are doing. Think carefully about that because it's a human brain that has to access that. And that human brain is not thriving with all this information. And just keep in mind as well, a lot of leaders maybe don't think about this. They are bombarding their teams, their employees with all of this information via all these apps and all these meetings and all these whatever they are. But guess what? When the person walks out of the office, 
at the end of the day or walks away from their desk if they're working from home, they don't stop getting information overload. Mm. They're checking their social media. They're checking yeah. the news. Very, and very so cool. mm. it continues. Mm. So those brains are coping with all of that work stuff. And then they've got all the stuff when they go home. This is all just information. You know, it's a tsunami of information. Then they go to sleep and their poor brains are so busy from the day. Um, often they've chosen the wrong kinds of foods. They've got blood glucose that's going up and down. They may have financial challenges. They may have relationship challenges, all those other things. Then they wake up in the morning and they're not refreshed again. And guess what? Mm. There's the information on the app again. There's yeah. this that they've got to do. So leaders really need to sit back and take a long, good look at what their overall goal is and whether what they're doing is supporting that long-term goal. And very often, they're just introducing technology for the sake of it, just because it exists. That is mm. no good excuse. When you look at the human factors related to creativity and decision-making, you know that more isn't necessarily better. Exactly. Amazing. You know, uh, Delia, I, I, want, I don't want to end here <laughs> because it's such a fascinating talk and uh, I'm learning a lot. And and uh, I had a wonderful time listening to you. And um, hopefully in the future, we can talk about more about the myths, you know, going on in, in the in the industry, in the, in the you know, uh, regarding brain. You know, I've seen a lot of like the psychometric tests and those myths flying around, you know, on LinkedIn, I've seen. And um, personally, I sometimes agree, sometimes I have to think, right? Is this the right thing to do? Is this is the correct? But having you coming on, Hopefully in the future, we can shatter those myths and talk about the real, real work, uh, real prefrontal cortex work. Yeah. So thank uh, you very much. I look much. forward yeah. to that. Thank yeah. you, Rohil. I look forward to that very much. Um, it's always fun to talk about the brain and yes, um, yeah. Dis yeah. dispel the myths. And I hope that yeah. your listeners enjoy this conversation. And if they want to follow me on LinkedIn, they can happily do that. Um, yeah. I know that. I found you via my white paper. Yes. So if yes, they, yeah, if yeah. anybody wants that white paper, they yeah. can just get hold of me via a DM on LinkedIn and I'll happily share that with them as well. Great. And I will add that into the description as well of our episode. Yeah. So they can contact you and, and obviously Fantastic. learn from you. I know you provide trainings as well, so they can contact you uh, for all the workshops, all the trainings you do yeah. for, for leaders. So thank you very much. Thanks for coming to this space. Have a great day. Take care. Stay, stay safe. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.